just to recap, the union has decertified and is now a professional association. So any hearing before the National Labor Relations Board and the Labor Department doesn't even matter because we're no longer a union. So the league is going to try to do something there, but, but nothing will occur. I saw Bob Batterman said that uh, the decision is the Labor Department. Well, how can that be? We're not even a union anymore. So that just shows you how disingenuous the league is. Jeff Pash, when his lips are moving, we know he's not telling the truth. He has not told the truth one time to the public, let alone to the media. And it's just really not fair in terms of him trying to go out and get fans to be against the players because it's just not going to work. We're very organized, we're very unified, and we're going to come out of this thing even stronger. Now, you're there in Florida with the retired players and also the player refs. What are you guys saying to each other? Is it a unified front? Oh, it's no question. We, look, we're giving them the history. Back in 1974, I let a strike at the Dallas Cowboys, and, and our strike said no freedom, no football. Well, it was about a month or two. That strike was broken, but we went to court to try to get free agency. And as a result of going to court, I was one of the first free agents. I started in Super Bowl 10, January of 76. That was my last game as a Cowboy. At that season, I made $21,000 for 20 games because I could not market my services to every team. But because of us going to court, that offseason, I was able to do that, and the Redskins signed me to a four-year guaranteed contract for over half a million dollars. Well, it sounds like it worked out well for you back in the 70s, and I imagine that you have a lot of good advice and experience to give to these guys. Have you guys found any evidence that would change your mind, change the situation, change the way you guys view what's going on, or maybe even the courts? Well, again, just to recap, uh, the union decertified, and a lot of fans I know find that very confusing, but what we did was is that we said that we would not be able to get a fair agreement collective bargaining as a union. The only way we've ever gotten advances in the past was under a judge's order because the owners will not negotiate in good faith with the players, notwithstanding the fact that they're accusing us of the same thing. So in the end, it was the Reggie White case that was the leverage that got us the last agreement, which we didn't really like. Nobody likes the franchise tag, transition tag, and waiting over four years and sometimes six years to be a free agent when the average career is less than four years. So that means most of the guys would never get a chance to get what they were really worth. So now we are back in court, and people have heard about, number one, and this is the most important thing, in April's hearing, we're asking for an injunction so that we can go back to work and that there will be games in the fall. The owners are fighting that. They don't want us to go back to work under those terms. So you that, believe, that's the first thing that's coming up. You believe up. There's a, there's, they've been planning a lockout for multiple years, and, and you say you have evidence of this? Yes. Uh, what was uncovered in the hearing before Judge Doty during what they call discovery, and that's a legal term where you have a right to look at the other side's legal documents, and they must turn over documents. Well, I just sent you a copy of a document called Decision Tree which is over two years old. And in the middle of that document, you can see the question asked was, does deal completion advance CBA negotiating dynamics? And underneath, under key factors, the first thing they have is cash needs during lockout, meaning they were planning to lock us out all along. And you believe that they're, that they're uh, cash trapped as well? Well, uh, what I understand is that they may be as much as $8 billion in debt. You know these teams' values have gone up, and the owners have been able to uh, you know, borrow against the value of the team. And what they uh, have, in fact, doing was uh, borrowing money and paying themselves all this time. And that's why they don't want to give us their financials. So that's the first thing we're trying to get in the discovery process is to find out how much money they're really making. And how much they're in debt, I would imagine, as well. That's well. That's going to be the, the lever that gets them to come back because there will be no more bargaining. So if there that... will be no more collective bargaining. The only way this is going to get settled is between the lawyers and uh, the owners will have to come and make proposals for the players to accept. If the league, if the teams are $8 billion in debt, how does that affect their need for money? And when they say that they're not making money, they're losing money, arguably on paper, 
if they're in debt, they are losing money. It just it's different because they're borrowing against what the team is worth. That's right. Yeah, they, they've, uh, and I'm not saying this is true for every team, but a number of teams have been very aggressive in either doing like a refi like you would at your house when the interest rates got low. So as a result, uh, there's a lot of debt, and they must make interest payments. And now that the TV money that they thought they were going to use to lock us out is sequestered, uh, I'm wondering what their strategy is now because they've locked us out, and, and, and we're fighting that in court. But also, the judge has already found them guilty, and we're going to have hearings on damages on how much of that $4 billion that the players, both current and former, will now receive in the future. That's no longer their money, because they got together with the TV networks to lock us out. Gene, you're, you're an attorney. In your mind, would you say that they got together to lock you guys out so that they could make more money? because basically, and pay down their debts, because basically without paying the players, without paying to use the stadiums, and without paying their staff, it's all profit on the money they were going to make from the television networks, which we now know they're not getting. But if they had gotten that money, they, they would have made a lot of money this year. Well, if they had gotten that money, there would be no need uh, for them to talk to us or anybody, because if they got $4 billion without a game being played, and that's the uh, uh, condition that they were hoping to be in until we won that decision in Minnesota. So that decision effectively says that they cannot use that TV money without sharing it for us. And not only that, they agreed to a lower deal to use the money to lock us out, which makes it even more heinous to me. Not, not only that, they're locking us out and they're locking out the people that sell the hot dogs, the people that do the parking, the people that print the programs and sell them. They're locking everybody out. Now, Gene, you said that the players want to play and that you're going to get an injunction so that you can play. How can you play with no union at this point with, with the contracts, I would imagine, would not, not withstand? And then even if they did, what about all the free agents? How could you actually play even if a judge gave an injunction that said the NFL had to have a season? Well, it's not clear under what rules or system, but I suspect that it would have to be very close to the system they used last year. So if we win on the injunction, that means that the players can immediately go back to work, the coaches can start coaching again, the guys doing off-season workouts and uh, rehabilitating injuries will have access to the facilities, and there will be games in the fall. Now, what the terms will be in the future, that's up to the owners to have to put into a system. But under prevailing labor law, they cannot impose unilaterally anything that's worse. So we suspect that it would be very much like it was last year when there was no salary cap and everybody knew what the rules were. So it would be something very close to that. Gene Fugit, thank you so much for joining us. We are going to have you on all week as the meetings continue and as you have more information. And we're going to open it up to callers uh, tomorrow and Wednesday and Thursday so that callers can call in and ask their questions uh, and talk to you directly. In addition to that, we'll be able, they'll be able to reach us via Twitter at sports underscore media, and they can email us as well, info at sports.com. Thanks so much, Gene. All right, thanks, Michael, and I hope everybody gets a chance to look at that decision tree. We're going to make that available, and we're just putting it out today. It was given to all of us at the meeting, and everybody knows about it now, so we can distribute it. And one of the first places that people will be seeing it will be on your website. Hopefully, you can put that still up called Decision Tree, and everybody can look for themselves what the owners have been planning on for the last two years. Thanks for letting us get this out, Michael. Well, uh, you're welcome, and uh, we will have it up on sports.com in uh, just a little while, so check back with us. Uh, if you're watching this not live as taped, then you probably can go right now to sports.com and download it and take a good look at it. I'm Michael Arches for everyone at sports. Thanks for watching. Be terrific.